Hey everyone, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Arch, and in this episode of Fundamentals of GPU Architecture, we're going to be talking about the two-loop approximation. So we're still talking about the cores and the architecture for the cores. And last time, when we were talking about the one-loop approximation, we we're, uh, were considering the architecture in terms of what you would expect just looking at the programmer's model. So, you know, the idea of, you know, you look at a warp, a warp will have an instruction, and then we'll go ahead and execute that instruction. And so if we want to hide the latency of, you know, a warp that has a long latency instruction, we just have multiple warps that we select between and we pick another warp to issue from. Now, uh, the other thing we covered, just kind of recap, was this idea of, you know, what happens if not all lanes within a warp will be executing that same instruction. And so in order to handle that, we talked about the SIMT stack and stack-based architectures for reconvergence, and we also talked about stackless architectures. Now, in this case, we're going to, you know, improve our view of the underlying GPU architecture by adding, you know, another level of scheduling. So that's why we call it the two-loop approximation. So uh, the real deficiency of the one-loop approximation is that we really just have a thread identifier and an address that we're considering, that address of the next instruction that is. But what it doesn't say is whether the next instruction to issue for the warp has a dependency on an earlier instruction. So what does this mean? It means in the one loop approximation, we have to wait for one warp's instruction to finish before we can issue another instruction from that warp because we don't, we're not keeping track of dependency information. So you know, why is this a problem? Well, it turns out that it's a problem because if you want to hide a long latency instruction uh, and you don't have this dependency information, that would mean that you would have to have a large number of warps on a single core to select between and pick one instruction from. Now, you know, as we already said, massively multi-threaded, uh, the nature of these things, you end up having a ton of state you have to keep around. And so, you know, if you all of a sudden are requiring to have even more and more and more warps uh, active at one point to issue from in order to hide latency, this becomes a problem because that ends up being a lot of state. So what we're really trying to tackle here is, you know, instead of having to have, you know, maybe a ridiculous number of warps to hide long latency instructions, what if instead, if we knew the dependency information, then we would need a smaller number of warps and we could just issue multiple instructions from those same warps. Oh, and all we really need to do is keep track of dependencies. And so in order to do this, uh, in GPUs, we've got an instruction buffer where instructions are placed after we get them from the instruction cache. And then we have a separate scheduler that decides which of several instructions within this buffer uh, can be issued or uh, should be issued to the uh, the next uh, should be issued next to the rest of the pipeline. So basically, we're just keeping track within the instruction buffer if that instruction is ready, if it doesn't have any dependencies. So kind of going backwards a little bit, giving a little bit of background. So instruction memory is implemented as a first level instruction cache backed by you know more uh, levels of secondary unified caches. So the instruction buffer can help in hiding instruction uh, cache miss latencies so you can think of the instruction buffer as you know basically another layer in this uh, hierarchy so you'll check to see if you've got instructions in the instruction buffer that you can issue um, you know you, you're also checking you know in the cache when you have to access a new instruction uh, and then likewise you go down further in the you know the hierarchy if you know an instruction is not in the cache so after a cache hit or a fill from a cache miss so when we're getting a new instruction the instruction information is placed into the instruction buffer and the organization of the instruction buffer can take uh, many forms but you know the most straightforward approach is just to have storage for one or more instructions per warp so now let's consider the idea of you know what we're really talking about here is uh, de detecting data dependencies now classically in cpus there's two main approaches which is this idea of having a scoreboard or reservation stations so with re reservation stations you know, we use uh, these to eliminate uh, name dependencies, uh, but this introduces the need for associative logic that's expensive in terms of error and, uh, and energy. Now, the reason why this is a problem is because when we're talking about uh, GPUs, we're talking about these giant, massively multi-threaded, uh, these giant, massively multi-threaded things. And the design kind of pattern for these things is you know, keep things simple because we just want to tape out, you know, as much uh, compute as we can. We care about you know the number of ALUs that we have. So once we start adding these very expensive and complex structures, we're really decreasing the amount of space we have for you know the raw compute. 
Now scoreboards, these are these can be designed to support you know in order execution like GPUs have, or out of order execution. Uh, now while the out of order execution uh, scoreboards can be uh, fairly complex, you know a scoreboard for you know single you know single threaded in order CPUs can actually be very simple. So each register is represented in the scoreboard with a single bit that is set uh, whenever an instruction issues that will write to that register. So basically what we're doing is that once an instruction issues, we check, okay, are you going to write to this uh, register? You set that bit, and then when later instructions come, they'll just have to check the scoreboard and see, okay, uh, that bit is busy. I can't, I can't do anything until that dependency is gone, or it's, uh, I'm no longer waiting on that dependency. Uh, so that's what we're saying here. So until that bit is cleared. So this prevents read after write and write after write hazards. So when combined with in order instruction issue, uh, this simple scoreboard can prevent write after read hazards, uh, provided that reading of the register file is constrained to occur in order, which is uh, typically the case in in order CPU designs. So you know because this is you know a fairly the simplest design and consumes the least amount of area and energy, this is really attractive for GPUs. So GPUs uh, implement in order scoreboards, but that doesn't mean that you know all of our problems are solved. As we keep bringing up, uh, GPUs are these massively multi-threaded things, so that in and of itself incurs um, a number of interesting issues. So what's the first concern? Well, with a simple in-order scoreboard, uh, you know we have a lot of registers uh, because of the massively multi-threaded uh, nature. So per warp, which is 32 threads, uh, we can have up to 120 registers per warp. Now, uh, if we have you know up to 64 warps um, per core, this means that we need to keep track of uh, 800 or 8192 bits or 8K of bits per core to implement a scoreboard. So already we see that you know we're trying to use massively uh, this massively multi-threaded thing. Uh, that in itself is going to have its own cost, as it always does. That we talked about earlier with the register file and the fact that the register files are so big. Uh, it's also going to co uh, complicate the fact that we need to, uh, for dependency tracking, that this, you know, this naive port from CPU to GPU is not really realistic. Now, another concern uh, with that simple in-order scoreboard design, if you just took it as is from the CPU and moved it to the GPU, is that, you know, when instruction encounters a dependency, it has to keep looking up its operands in the scoreboard uh, to see that to see if it's ready, right? To see if the uh, the dependencies are gone. Now, uh, with a single threaded design, this introduces a little complexity. But you know, when you have an in order issue multi threaded processor, instructions from multiple threads may be waiting for earlier in instructions to complete. So, if all such instructions must probe the scoreboard, uh, additional read ports are required. So, recent GPUs support up to sixty four warps per core, as we mentioned up here. Uh, with up to four operands allowing all warps to probe the scoreboard every cycle would require 256 read ports now this is just uh, an insane number right so having something uh you know this many read ports would just be you know it's very cost prohibitive so we don't want to do that so we need to find a way around it now uh one way that we could go around it in kind of the you know naive a simple way is just to restrict the number of warps that can be considered for scheduling. Um, now, this this itself has its own problem because you know our main benefit was having a massively multi-threaded system, and now in order to handle the massively multi-threaded system, we're saying you need to decrease the amount of parallelism you have. So it's kind of a, this circular problem that ends up creeping up uh, quite a bit. But you know both of these issues. Uh, the fact that the large amount of state and things like read ports, they can be addressed using a design uh, from 2008. And then, which basically is, you know, rather than hold a single bit per register per warp, uh, you know, the design contains a small number, estimated to be three or four by, you know, a 2016 study of entries per warp, where each entry is the identifier of a register that will be written by an instruction that has been issued but not yet completed execution. So these are the ones that are outstanding. So a regular in-order scoreboard is accessed both uh, when the instruction issue and when they write back. But instead, this uh, design from 2008, the scoreboard is accessed when instruction is placed into the instruction buffer. So when it goes into the instruction buffer, it checks, OK, where are my dependencies? And it'll keep it there in the instruction buffer. 
Uh, and then uh, when the instruction is uh, when an instruction writes its results to the register file, so it'll update its dependencies when uh, an instruction is finishing. So uh, when an instruction is fetched from the instruction cache and placed into the instruction buffer, so these, the scoreboard entries for the corresponding warp are compared against uh, the instruction source and destination registers. So we need to figure out where the dependencies lie. And uh, if there's uh, outstanding dependencies for, uh, out, or if there's dependencies for outstanding instructions, so this results in a short bit vector uh, with one bit for each entry in the scoreboard for that warp, so three or four bits. So a bit is set if the corresponding entry in the scoreboard match any of the operands from the instruction. So this bit vector is then copied alongside the instruction into the instruction buffer. So now we have the structure that not only has our instruction, but it also has encoded its dependency information. Now, an instruction is only eligible to be considered for scheduling if it's all of its bits are cleared. And that's the same thing if, um, just like in a normal scoreboard, if you know a bit is cleared, that just means that the dependency is gone. Or rather, you don't have to wait on that dependency. So this is actually a pretty simple thing that we can do. So you can just feed all of those bits into a NOR gate. So a NOR gate will do an OR and then the reverse of it. And so the only way that that will be a one is if all of the uh, inputs are zero. So basically all the dependencies are done, all right? So if you have, you know, a simple OR gate here, pretty poor drawing and you have four inputs, right? So the output would only be a one if all of these inputs are zero, right? And then this would be an output of a one. Okay, all right, so if all entries are used up for a given warp, then it uh, either fetch stalls for all warps or the instruction is discarded and must be fetched again. So you can just throw away an instruction and say, okay, just try and get it again. So when instruction that is executed is ready to write to the register file, it clears uh, the entry that was allocated to it in the scoreboard and also uh, clears the corresponding uh, dependency bit for any instructions from the same warp that is stored in the instruction buffer. So it has to clear two things, right? So it has to clear, you know, here's the scoreboard that, that contains the uh, dependency information and then all the little bit vectors that may depend on that instruction, you gotta clear those as well. So, you know, basically the key idea is that in this two loop architecture, the first loop that we described uh, up front, it's like so warp that has space in the instruction buffer, looks at the program counter and performs the instruction cache access to obtain the next instruction. So we've got these warps and we need to pick, say, hey, you, you're the one that's going to, um, we need an instruction from you now. And you've got space in the instruction buffer, go ahead and put an instruction in the instruction buffer. Now the second loop itself goes, okay, now that we have all these instructions, we have to figure out which ones are eligible to execute. And these can be multiple instructions from the same warp. And all that we have to do is we need to check to make sure that its dependencies are cleared. So that's the key idea uh, behind the two loop approximation. So this handles uh, the original problem of only having uh, being able to do uh, one instruction from a warp and needing a lot of warps. Instead, we can cut down on the number of warps and issue multiple instructions from the same warp. Now, uh, you know, we're going to continue on in the next video on the three loop approximation, and we're going to be talking some interesting thing or about some interesting things, including uh, you know how we actually access the register file when we've got all these instructions. But um, that's going to do it for this time. Uh, as always, feel free to check out the GitHub page at github.com slash coffee before arch. This is where we handle, or this is where I post all the code for my other series, including GPU programming with CUDA. So that'll be directly related to GPU architecture, as well as other things like, you know, Python programming, C++ programming, and uh, parallel programming in C++. So feel free to check that out. Uh, we also have um, a book that I'm writing called A Tour of Programming. And we've got the uh, draft up here. So this is going to be an in progress thing where we're going to cover, you know, all the videos that I have, um, all the videos that I have on YouTube. These are all going to be turned into written tutorials, you know, going through parallel programming, optimizations, object oriented code design, GPU program with CUDA. Those are going to have their own uh, examples, some Verilog stuff, uh, as well as, you know, things related to research. So this will be uh, cycle level simulators like GPGPU sim that I work with rather frequently, other simulators like Jim5 and uh, SST, and going over some contemporary research papers and kind of summarizing, you know, the fields that I'm interested.
But that's going to do it for this video. As always, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Arch, and I hope you have a nice day.